right, so we got a certain vending machine offers 20 ounce bottles of soda. Soda for $1.50. Numbers of bottles X bought from the, sh the machine on any days are random variable with mean 50 and standard deviation 15. Let the random variable Y equal the total revenue from this machine on, any gi on a given day. Assume that the machine works properly and that most sodas are stolen from the machine. What are the mean and standard deviation Y? All right, so here we got some calculations that we have to do involving random variables. Let's get going. So um, we have, you know, X, you know, tells you how many, is, you know, represents how many um, bottles they bought. And if Y makes, represents how much money they make, revenue. So if each bottle is $1.50, then the revenue or the money made is going to be equal to 1.5 times that. Yeah, simple. Okay. Now, um, we have the mean of x is 50, and the standard deviation of x is 15. So what's the mean and standard deviation of y? OK, so we have the mean of y and standard deviation of y. Now, this is uh, what's called a linear transformation. You're multiplying. Um, x by uh, a scalar, some number to get y, which is the number is 1.5. So when you want to find the mean of y, you simply just have to multiply the mean of x by 1.5. So it's just 1.5 times the mean of x. And that'll be um, 75. I'm going to squeeze it in here, 1.5 times 50. I'm actually going to use this next line to x and just standard deviation. I'll need actually some more space to show the work thoroughly. The mean of y will be 75. I really like these symbols. Greek alphabet is something. All right, now the standard deviation of y. This is going to be a little different. Now, um, so standard deviations do multiply, that is correct? Sort of. <laughs> um, what we're going to want to do is um, find the, the variance of y, because the, the square root of the variance of y is the standard deviation. Um, because we can't simply get standard deviation um, by multiplying by 1.5, because it's going to be a little different, a little more than that. What's going to happen is um, the we find the variance of y first. The variance of y will be the variance of x times 1.5 squared. So the variance of y will be 1.5 squared times the variance of x. And you're like, well, why do you multiply the 1.5 squared? Um, um, why, do you, why do you square the 1.5 as well? Well, it's because technically you're not, um, um, it's, it's like a whole new variable. So if you're finding a whole new variable that you're squaring, this whole thing has to be squared, you know? So you're doing 1.5x times 1.5x. It's not like 1.5 times x squared. So it's, it's, you know, this whole thing times itself. So because y squared would be, you know, 1.5x times 1.5x. That's really it. Don't think of, don't overthink that. But now we just find this, then we take the square root of that. And then we'll get the standard deviation of y. So we do 1.5 squared, 2.25 times the standard deviation of x squared, 15, 2.5, 2.25 times 225. We get that this will be the square root of 506.25. Take the square root of that. It gives us 22.5 as their standard deviation. And so then our answer will be B. All right. All right, problem six. The weights of tomatoes, tomatoes chosen at random from a bin at the farmer's market Follows a normal distribution of mean 10 ounces and standard deviation one ounce. 
Suppose you pick four tomatoes at random from the bin, you find a total weight T. The random variable T is, all right, so what type of distribution we got going on? We're told that we have a normal distribution for the weight of the tomatoes. So let's, look, let's, let's, let's work with that. So the normal distribution with a mean of 10, standard deviation of one. But we have a whole new variable T that's made up by the, as a sum of, of four tomato weights. So T is basically um, X1, which is a random tomato weight pick, plus X2, plus X3, plus X4. It's the sum of, of the sum of the weights of four randomly selected tomatoes. <clears throat> now, the mean of T is just simply going to be the mean of X1 plus the mean of X2 plus the mean of X3 plus the mean of X4. So I'm going to write the notation just because I like writing it. It looks cool. And you should definitely practice the notation in this chapter because it's it's really helpful. It makes stuff a lot more simpler to understand once you get it down. Um, all these are the same because they're all coming from the same distribution. So they're all 10. So it's really just 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10 or 4 times 10. So it's really just 40. So the mean weight of T, mean of T is 40. Now the standard deviation for that, we're going to find the variance of T. We find the variance first, then we take the standard deviation, then we take the square of that variance. And the variance of T will simply be the variance of X1 plus the variance of X2 plus the variance of X3 plus the variance of X4. You just add them all. I'm going to write the, the notation again because I like it. We do that. Da da da. To X to, to all the way to the fourth one. And the standard deviations are all the same. These are very easy numbers to square because they're all one. So you have one squared plus one squared plus one squared plus one squared, which will add up to four. So the variance of t is four. So we take the square root of four to get the standard deviation. And so the standard deviation of t is just two. So mean of t is 40, standard deviation is two. And it's still going to be normal. Distribution is still going to be normal. Don't, don't overthink this and think it's binomial. So we're going to have normal with a mean of 40 and standard deviation of 2 to B. Six point seven. Which of the following random variables is geometric? Uh, okay, let's, re let's review, or let me just kind of re quickly re re uh, summarize what geometric random variables are. Very similar to, to binomial random variables, except you're just um, counting the number of tries or number of trials until you get a success. So um, the main difference is that with Binomially random variables, you have the number of, you know, trials fixed ahead of time. And you basically counted the number of successes out of those trials. So like, it's like, if you roll a, a die 10 times, count the number of sixes. Where a geometric would be, roll a, I'll roll a die until you get a six. So let's look at these. The number of times I have to roll a die to get two sixes. <clears throat> mm, sort of, but close to notes. It says two sixes. We only, it would be fine if it says one six. So it's, the number of times you have to roll to get one six, so it's not going to be a. The one from hydration right now. <clears throat> well, the number of cards I deal from the well shuffle deck of fixed two cards until I get a heart. Um, no, because you're counting the number of cards. This is, this is cleverly worded. You're not counting the number of cards. Um, that wouldn't count. Not be. The number of well, actually, well, I actually kind of explain it differently. It's not because of that. It's not this one still, but it's, it's because um, you're told you have fifty two cards. Yeah, let me. Uh, I that was confused. I kind of didn't mean to confuse you there. The number of cards that that's fine actually, but it's telling you you're gonna have only 52 cards to pick from. So it has a fixed number of trials in that sense. So this wouldn't count as geometric because you're told the number of trials ahead of time. 
All right, C, the number of digits I read in the randomly selected row of random digits until I find seven. Okay, so this would be our answer. Because um, you're just going um, and looking at the digits until you get a seven. So that'll be your success. So until you get one success, so you're counting how many trials um, you would take before you find a seven. So that's the geometric random variable. So that'll be C. And let me just go over D and Y, D and E are not. Number of sevens in a row, 40 random digits. No, because you're told, again, you're, you're given the fixed trials. You're given the N equals 40 ahead of time. So it's not that. The number of sixes I give, I roll a die 10 again. That's not E again. For the same reason, you're given the trials ahead of time. So your answer is definitely C. All right, 6.8. 17 people have been exposed to a particular disease. Disease. Each one independently has a 40% chance of contracting the disease. So let's, let's, let's uh, emphasize that. Independently has a 40% chance of contracting the disease. A hospital has the capacity to handle 10 cases of the disease. What is the probability that the hospital's capacity will be exceeded? Okay. So let's change this into the math equation. So we want to find the probability that the hospital is going to have more than 10 cases. So let's say that X is the number of cases. So the probability of X is 10. Because they can handle 10, but more than that is they can't handle it. So the capacity would be exceeded. So we want to find the probability that X is greater than 10. So um, this is going to be a, a example of a binomial random variable. It's a binomial setting. Binomial setting because we have 17 people, we have a fixed number of trials. And the 17 each have the probability of, of getting a 40% of getting the disease. So P is 0.4. And our boundary values is um is 10. And well, we'll actually yeah, go over this in a bit. It's not necessarily that at k equals 10. Um, so it's a little different, but that's going to be like our boundary value. So essentially, we can just use the binomial um, random variable formula to calculate this. And you can do it by hand, but I would recommend the calculator. But, you know, it's, it's quicker and less chance for mistake. So what we can find the probability that x is greater than or equal to 10 in our calculator. However, the calculator can find only less than a certain number. So the calculator can find the probability that x is less than 10, but it can't find it that, that it's greater than 10. But you can rearrange this and rewrite this as being equal to one minus the probability that x is less than or equal to 10. Because this is what the calculator can do. The calculator does this. So if you find this in the calculator and you subtract that from one and you'll get this. So the probability that x is greater than or equal to 10 will be one minus. And for this in your calculator, we're gonna use a, the cumulative density function, the binomial CDF. So going back, going, going, going to go to distribution in your calculator. That's the old school one. And I'm gonna use binomial CDF. 1 minus binomial CDS. And this calculates the probability using the syntax n first, so n is 10, or n is 17, n 17, p is 0.4, and k would be um, 10. So that would, that, this would give me, this calculation would give me this right here. So um, remember this is old school calculator, so I have to just memorize it. So the NPK in that order, 17 comma 0.4 comma 10, just like that. If you have a newer one, it's probably easier to use because you probably are told like um where exactly to enter, you know, the probability, the number of trials, and that's and that's sort of and all and you know and all the parameters. All right, so this is that. Calculate that. So um, that's 
the, that's what that is equal to. So we do one minus that value, one minus 0.96, Five one eight seven two seven one four about point oh three four eight one two seven two eight six and so that's about three and a half percent and so that's gonna be the answer would be the all right go. So. 